So how cold is too cold to be going flying? How cold does it have to be before it's time to plug in the airplane, get it in the heated hangar, or plug it in and try to preheat it before you go fly? Is it bad to go fly when it's really cold? Is it bad to go try to start up the airplane without preheating it? All those are really good questions, and that's what we're going to be answering today as we dive into some pistons, cylinders, preheating the airplane in the hangar and outside the hangar, doing all sorts of testing and figuring out how long does it take to properly preheat an airplane, what is the right way to do it, and what are the consequences or what's really going on inside the engine if we don't properly preheat the engine to a safe temperature or a good temperature before trying to start it when it is cold. Hey guys, I'm John from Fly at Mike Alpha. I'm here at the brand new Fly at Mike Alpha Pilot Lodge in Big Lake, Alaska. It is November and it is negative 18 degrees outside right now. Kind of chilly. So, if this airplane was parked outside on the ramp, now here inside the hangar, it's a lovely 55 degrees. Outside there, it's negative 18. So if it was parked out on the ramp, it'd be negative 18 right now. So would the pistons, so would the cylinders and all that stuff. So, we need to take a close look here at exactly how metal expands and contracts as temperature changes, as well as how long does it take to actually heat the metal properly, not just heat the oil, not just heat perhaps the cylinder heads, not just heat your battery or anything like that. How long does it take to actually properly preheat the whole engine? And look at some different types and methods of preheating airplanes, whether it be with a torpedo heater or a built-in preheat system, perhaps a little pad on the oil pan, or even a more fancy Tannis type system that actually has bands or some sort of cylinder head probes to actually heat the cylinders and the oil and all that stuff separately. So we'll take a look at all that stuff. We'll start off with looking at the airplane and how long it takes to actually preheat it using the preheat system that's on this airplane, which is just a silicone rubber pad on the bottom of the oil pan or on the bottom of the oil sump. Very common to many aircraft. And then we'll go ahead and take a look at all our metal components that we're leaving outside right now to get nice and chilly. We'll take some measurements and see how they actually react at the low temperatures and how they expand at the higher temperatures, how those tolerances inside of our engine changes, and exactly how we can preheat the engine a little bit more effectively, how to properly go ahead and insulate the airplane as it's getting warmed up, ready to fly. So to do this the best way possible, we're gonna go ahead and measure the oil temperature by putting a little temperature probe down the oil dipstick tube right there into the oil sump. We're gonna measure the battery temperature because that's gonna dictate how many amps the battery can actually kick out, reducing wear and tear on the starter, ultimately the voltage regulator and alternator as well, the whole charging system. And we'll measure the cylinder head temperature with a third probe. That's going to go ahead and give us a good idea of the internals of the engine, the crank, the cam, the journals, the bearings, all that sort of stuff. Now we can see what we've got here, 5.45 p.m. we start, ambient temperature in the hangar, 45 degrees, oil temperatures on the left, our cylinder temperatures in the top right, and our uh, battery temperature is in the bottom right. So we started off at 49 on the oil temp, 43 on the battery and the actual uh, cylinders. We can see here three hours in, we're already up to 60 degrees on the cylinders, almost 130 degrees on the oil temp. Really after just two hours, that was plenty of time to get this thing warmed up. And as we go ahead and unplug this, just about oh, five hours into the whole situation, we're at 132 degrees on the oil temp, 65 on the cylinder head, and over 50 degrees on the battery. So things did come up there by over 20 degrees on the cylinder and the battery and quite a bit on the oil. Now putting a blanket on the airplane makes a huge difference here. So we can see by putting the blanket on, well, temperatures start rising pretty rapidly there. So now we can see our cylinder heads increasing, especially the cylinders really noticing that right away as we block the air inlets on the front of the airplane. We can also see our oil temperature getting a little bit hotter. And as we fast forward here towards the end, well, we can see things are actually really hot. So almost 85 degrees on the cylinder head, oil over 140 degrees, almost too hot. Bottom line is you do not want to leave this airplane plugged in preheating, especially with the blanket on it, for any great length of time. Plugging in for two or three hours, more than enough, and obviously putting a blanket or a cowling cover on it, even if it is in the hangar and not outside, definitely recommended. You want to insulate something you're heating, right? You don't try to live in an uninsulated house. You want to insulate something that you're going to heat. You want to insulate the cowling since you are heating that. That'll keep all the other components inside that engine compartment nice and warm. So the blanket or an engine cover works really well. This was just an old junk sleeping bag we had laying around. So even if you don't want to spend the money on a cowling cover, you can still insulate things and get stuff nice and warm and not waste a lot of electricity, not waste a lot of time. And most importantly, 
Do not leave this thing plugged in for 12 or 15 hours trying to get it warmer because your oil is going to be cooking away like crazy while the other components are just slowly coming up, insulating the thing and plugging in for two or three hours. Definitely your safest bet there. Now let's go ahead and see what is hot and what is not. Well, really, the entire engine is nice and warm. We can see everything's orange, nice and warm, over 70 degrees Fahrenheit in there. That's the starter motor sticking off the back of the engine there out to the right. Firewall, battery box, all that's a little bit cooler in the 60 degree range, closer, more in line with the ambient temperature of the air in the hangar. We can see the cylinders, the case, all nice and warm. We can see the spark plug wire uh, in there, actually nice and warm as well. The actual spark plug, all that heat conductivity from the cylinder up into the spark plug itself, all getting that stuff up around the 70 degree range nice and toasty. Now let's go ahead and duck under the cowling to look from the bottom up and see what is warm under there. Okay, a little bit on the sketchy side here. We can see the center of that silicone heating pad over 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, paper auto ignites at 451 Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit 451. Uh, luckily, fuel and oil auto ignites at a higher temperature, but that's pretty dang hot to have that under there. Obviously, the oil temperature is not that warm, but it is heating at that temperature and then diffusing throughout that metal. Now, let's go ahead and pull the airplane outside the hangar. Let this thing start cooling down. We can see we're starting here at about 3.30 p.m., and the temperature is rapidly dropping. Well, it's about negative five outside. It's just taking time for the temperature to actually come down on that outside temperature thermometer. We can see an hour into things here, really not too bad and even two hours in, still not that bad. So let's go ahead and freeze here at two hours into our cooling cycle. We can see oil still about 50 degrees, cylinder head 25, little chilly, but not that bad. An hour into things, we were at 80 degrees almost on the oil and 31 or actually 37 make that on the cylinder heads. So still an hour later, plenty good to start. Bottom line, don't be in a rush when you pull the airplane out of the hangar. It's not gonna cool down that quickly. It was about negative five Fahrenheit that day with really no wind. If it was 10 and above and windy, it would cool down quicker. Now let's let the airplane get cold soaked overnight and then we'll go ahead and try to heat it back up and see how long that takes. Our temperatures are low enough that, well, it's, uh, it's showing that we have no temperature on that little remote sensor. We're using the remote sensor because we've got the little sending unit covered up there. We've got this guy covered up with a blanket. We're gonna throw one more blanket on him, try to cover up those exhaust holes a little bit as if we had a real engine cowling cover for this thing. But it is plugged in. So about 1 p.m. we're starting this thing. We'll see how it goes and how long it takes to actually get anything to register on this temperature sensor here. I'm not sure what the minimums are, but we saw it working at 40, so we'll see if we can get anything close to 40 on this thing. Now, it didn't take too long for us to see the temperature budge there on the oil temperature. Obviously, that's going to heat first because the big hot silicone pad is right underneath it. That silicone pad was over 300 degrees Fahrenheit just 10 minutes into the process, measuring it with the infrared temperature gun. 30 minutes in, we saw about 30 degrees oil temperature. And now, two hours into it, well, we can see oil temperatures above 80 degrees, but cylinder head's still pretty cool, mostly due to the fact that we had a very terrible blanket on this airplane. We didn't have a real engine cover, so the insulation there was not very good. Also bear in mind, it was starting from about negative 10 Fahrenheit. I know the outside air temperature there on the left was saying it's a little bit warmer. That's really just due to the sun hitting the cabin. As it got dark out, you can see negative 10 Fahrenheit and more. So very cold there. About nine hours into it. What are we looking at here? Looks like we've got about 19 on the cylinder head, 93 on the oil, and two on the battery. Not very warm. Now, I know it's really difficult to read those digital screens there and the readouts of the temperature, but if you pause and look closely, you'll be able to see it. Really, four hours into this was the same as nine hours in. The aircraft, the oil, the cylinders, nothing really got any hotter. You just simply need better insulation on that nose for such extreme cold temperatures or simply more heat. Now, Putting more heat on the bottom of that oil pan, not a great idea. That's probably where the tannis and the reef heaters come into play, where you can distribute the heat over the whole area of the engine. But for this 220 some watts that we're supplying to the very bottom of the oil pan, that's about the most I would want to put there because that thing was cooking away plus 400 degrees, even though it was negative 10 degrees outside. And that's as hot as it could get the entire engine with that crummy little blanket we had on it.
We then unplugged the airplane, let it cool down overnight, and about 2 o'clock pulled it back into the hangar, really starting about 3 p.m. to thaw it out and see how long it was going to take. So you can see that ambient air temperature rising. The hangar was truly about 50-some degrees, but obviously the temperature sensor is just a little slow to come up there. We can see, oh, about a half hour in here, well, we're just barely budging the temperature on the cylinders. The cylinders are what is coming up first. Then in the middle there, we can see the battery temperature because that's coming up slower, and the oil being liquid is really surrounded by all that metal it's really holding its temperature and being pretty stubborn to come up so putting the airplane in the hangar here we can see a full hour in nothing registering on that oil and about 15 on the battery 24 on the cylinders it's taken some time and we'll go ahead and speed things up here we can see that snow and everything melt away a little bit quicker and now we can finally see the oil coming up about two hours in oil is finally at zero degrees we can see that the cylinder heads, however, are almost 30 degrees two hours in. So it's slowly coming up to the ambient temperature in the hangar. We'll skip ahead here a little bit, and we can see now four hours in, 7 p.m., we've got the oil up around 30, cylinder heads around 44, and all the snow is melted. You'd say, okay, it's time to go fly now. Four hours was a good amount of time to have it in the hangar. Problem with that is the airplane is still wet. It's going to have to sit in the hangar overnight to actually dry out because any water on it right now will refreeze and probably freeze up your ailerons, your flaps, your trim, and all sorts of other things you don't want to have frozen if you were to go try to fly it right now while well, it's all wet. So although four hours is a good time to thaw out the airplane and get it up to temperature, probably needs a little bit longer to actually dry out and be safe to go fly. All right, so we just brought in a piston and a cylinder from outside. It has been sitting out there for quite some time. It is a nice chilly negative 12. And uh, well, that's actually shown a little bit warmer. Oh, no, negative eight, negative nine on our piston as well. So before this stuff warms up, we're gonna go ahead and take some measurements here and see exactly what the diameters are to get an idea for the tolerances. Obviously the piston goes inside the cylinder and we wanna make sure that they're not loose. The idea is if it's too cold, it could be loose in there and flopping around. As it heats up, it expands. We want things to be expanded to the proper tolerances. So we'll go ahead and measure this and we can say pretty confidently that, I'll go ahead and call it 5.21. Yeah, I'd say about 5.21, so 10 thousandths, 5.21 inches for the diameter of that, uh, of that piston at, well, like we said, pretty chilly, about, yep, negative nine. <laughs> we'll go ahead and put this little tool inside of our cylinder here. It's going to go in there and actually expand, and then we'll measure the diameter of it. So we'll go ahead and try to get the widest diameter there, just about, three or four inches inside that cylinder bore. Well, maybe we'll actually do this more precisely. We'll stick it all the way so where it's just even. So it's about five, six inches in there. And we'll go ahead. So we're seeing that's actually about 5.235, I'd call it. 5.235. That one's a little bit harder to measure, so we're gonna do it a couple times just to make sure we get good, accurate numbers. And 5.252. So. We'll go ahead and call it about 5.252 for the actual diameter of this guy. So currently, a uh, pretty good difference there between that and the diameter of our actual piston. Now there's a little bit of ice forming on here from the condensation being inside the hangar, so hopefully that doesn't mess with our measurements too much. We'll try to scrape that off. All right, without the ice there, we're looking at about 5.21 still, maybe 5.211. Yeah, about 5.211, uh, knocking off some of the ice that's forming on that thing from the condensation in the air here. Uh, now, how much is a thousandth of an inch anyways? Well, a piece of paper is about four thousandths of an inch. So just to go ahead and show you or give you an idea, we'll go ahead and take a little measurement here. So this thin paper and this weird instruction manual that, of course, you know, we're pilots, we don't read instructions. We'll go ahead and measure that to be about... Well, about three thousandths, almost four thousandths of an inch. Uh, a sheet of 20 pound copy paper that you'd put in your printer, typically about four thousandths of an inch. Next up, we're gonna get these things heated up to operating temperature. Typical uh, cylinder head temperature for your engine is about 350 to 400 degrees when you're cruising around. So we'll oh get boy. these kind of in that ballpark. Uh, a little bit of oil that was still on there, unfortunately, that kind of got cooked off, but let's see what we were able to heat these up to here. 
Now the big thing we're going to see here is really that the aluminum piston is going to expand a lot more than the steel cylinder, 50, thus the actual tolerance between the piston and the cylinder wall is going to shrink quite a bit. So with our cold piston, we had a measurement of 5.210, now we've got 5.231, so it's expanded quite a bit there. The cylinder went from 252 to 258, so just about six thousandths larger, so that gap's a lot smaller. Next up we want to look at our oil viscosity, you can see oil temperature here about 5, 10 degrees, it's like really thick molasses. So it just does not flow at all. It does not protect the actual metal between the piston and the cylinder wall. So your cylinder wall is going to get scarred up. It's going to damage the rings on the sides of the piston. And then when we compare that to just oil that I just drained literally out of the airplane here after being preheated for a few hours in the hangar, you can see 100 degree oil coming right out of that sump flows like water, much more lubricity there. All right, so what are the main takeaways here from this video? Well, ultimately the single most important thing to know is that when you pull an airplane that is warm out of a hangar, don't be in a rush. You've got 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. Say you forgot to file a flight plan. You forgot some stuff in the car you want to go grab. You might have to run back in and go to the bathroom or something. No need to rush. That airplane is doing just fine, even if it's zero degrees out there. Now, if it's zero degrees or 20 below and blowing 20, which you probably wouldn't be going flying in anyways, well, yeah, you might want to get in within 30 minutes or so. But even if you fire that thing up after 60 minutes, 90 minutes, almost even two hours, I wouldn't feel that bad about it, especially if you had taken it out of the hangar with an engine blanket on it and it still had the engine blanket on it out there, I think it would hold that heat for quite a while. So other really important takeaway, what's the best preheat system there is out there? Well, we had a $150 little heating pad on the bottom of this guy. That's an FAA approved one. Obviously Napa has them for 20 bucks for your experimentals out there, but a little less safe, probably less safety features built in for overheat protection. And then you got things like reef heaters that are seven, eight, nine hundred dollars You got Tannis heaters that are $1,200, $1,300. So the idea with the reef heaters and the Tannis heaters, they're trying to heat the whole case and the cylinders as well. What you saw here is that we did that. We heated the case and the crank and the internals and the cylinders also. After just about two to three hours, especially if we had a blanket on there to contain that heat. So what's the best thing you can do? Well, go ahead and buy yourself a really nice custom fit engine cowling cover. All right, something that's gonna be waterproof, that's got some insulation to it, that's going to hold the heat in there and fits really well. And then also, well, you can do whatever you want, whether it's a Tannis or a Reef or that little silicone pad stuck on the bottom. This video was not sponsored by anybody, so I'm not trying to sell you on either way, but for me, what am I gonna do on my next airplanes when I have to install a heater if it doesn't come with one? Well, I'm probably gonna do the silicone pad thing, invest in a nice five, six, eight hundred dollar engine cowling cover that's going to help keep the heat in there. And then I probably won't go 250 watts on that silicone pad because the one thing I did not like about it is simply how hot that thing was getting, way over 300 degrees. If my oil is way over 300 degrees, almost 400 degrees, well, the oil is going to start to degrade. It's going to start to burn up the bottom of that oil pan a little bit. Not really a huge fan. So another big takeaway, don't leave these things plugged in for a day, two days, three days, a week or whatever. Some people leave their airplanes plugged in for months in a hangar. You're destroying your engine because you're heating that oil at the bottom in all that moisture and your case, no matter what, is going to be colder than the bottom. It's going to heat the moisture and water that's in there. It's going to condense at the top of the case. It's going to make a nice little rainforest effect inside that engine, rusting your cam and all the other different parts and pieces of the internals of your engine. Don't do that. Use something like this, a little $10 plug on Amazon, a little Wi-Fi plug so you can go on your phone and tell Alexa, hey, turn on the airplane preheat. Or they have those little $50 ones and it's a few bucks a month if you don't have Wi-Fi in your hangar or where you're parked at the airport. It's a cell phone triggered one. You can call into a number and turn it on remotely that way. It has cell service directly to the unit. So there's different ways to go about doing this to just preheat your airplane for the two to four hours that you really need to, saving electricity and saving the engine and saving the heating element. Keep in mind, if you do splurge on that $1,200 heating element, heating package from Tannis or something, well, it only works for so many hours. The heating element literally is burning itself up every time it's turned on. So don't just leave it plugged in for days on end. You're not doing anybody any favors. You're not helping yourself at all. Now, as far as starting these engines, 
when it's just bone chilling cold outside, zero degrees, you can see that piston shrinks quite a bit and expands quite a bit up to operating temperature. And there's even a difference between zero degrees and 50, 60 degrees in the hangar or preheated properly. So there's definitely an advantage to preheating these airplanes and they start a lot easier. Why do they start so much easier? Aside from the piston being expanded a little bit, those tolerances being tighter and there being more compression in the cylinders to actually ignite it. Well, your battery's warmer, so it has more voltage, more amps to flow. The starter will actually be able to start the engine a little bit easier. The oil is a little bit thinner, so it's looser, so it can actually spin the engine uh, easier rather than having all that resistance of cold, sticky oil. You can see how that cold oil just does not flow well at all. And then on top of all that, fuel actually likes to be warm to vaporize. It's going to vaporize easier, just like when you have hot water, there's more steam coming off it until eventually it boils. Well, warm fuel is going to ignite a lot easier because remember, liquid fuel does not burn whatsoever. If I drop a match or light a match underneath in a five gallon bucket of gasoline underneath the gas in the middle of the bucket where it's fully submerged, it's not going to ignite. Only fuel vapors burn. So we need that fuel to vaporize so that's why you typically are priming your engine a little bit more in the cold. What you're really doing is adding more fuel, so there's more fuel surface area in the intake system to vaporize and give you that fuel vapor that's needed to ignite it. Now, if the engine is warmer, it's going to help that fuel ignite a little bit easier or vaporize more so it'll ignite easier. If the airplane's been in the hangar and the fuel is warmer in the wings and ultimately what's most important, the fuel temperature in the wing doesn't really matter at all. It's really the fuel temperature at the carburetor or wherever it's being injected to from the fuel injectors that really matters. If that's nice and warm, then that fuel will vaporize so much easier. Now, another important thing to take away from this video is notice how the snow and ice and water melts on the airplane after an hour, two, three, four hours in. It's all melted four or five hours after being in the hangar, but it's still wet. Don't take that wet airplane back outside below freezing and go fly it. Don't take the wet airplane outside in 30 some degrees, like 35 or 40 degrees, and then go fly it and climb up into colder air. Stuff freezes. Ask me how I know. You can do a flight control check and you can work your trim and you can work your flaps all on the ground just fine, below freezing, above freezing with a wet airplane, and you can take off just a few minutes later and have stuff start freezing on you. The last place that moisture is going to evaporate from on your airplane, especially if you don't have fans going in your hangar, is in those tight little crevices on your aileron hinges, on your flap hinges, in that really nice piano hinge on your trim tab. That's gonna be the last place to get the moisture out of because it's a tight area. There's not a lot of airflow through it naturally. Well, what does that mean? Those are the critical areas that you actually want to have water free. Honestly, if there's a few drops on the bottom of your wing, probably not gonna take you out of the sky. However, if you get flight controls frozen up, flaps, trim tabs frozen up, bad things can happen. So make sure if you're gonna put the airplane in the hangar to thaw it out, try to do so overnight. It seems about, Anywhere from eight to 12 hours is a good amount of time. Certainly lower humidity in the hangar, the warmer it is, and fans all can speed up that process. But putting an airplane in a hangar for an hour or two doesn't really seem to do you any good whatsoever. Might actually cause some problems for you with, with thawing some ice and snow, and then that stuff refreezing becoming a big problem for you. So that is all I've got for you for this video. Now, obviously a lot of people watch our videos who are not subscribed to the channel. Why do you even want to subscribe to this channel? Hit that little subscribe button down there in the bottom right and hit that bell, why? Well, because there's a lot of cool stuff like this video and a lot of other cool experiments we're doing out here at the flight Mike Alpha Pilot Lodge. A lot of cool things happening, building runways, building cabins, lots of fun projects, lots of cool flying opportunities for you guys to come up and visit us, see what's going on up here. So to stay notified and up to date of all that, be sure to hit the subscribe button down there in the bottom right, hit the bell notification and select to get notified of all the latest updates coming from us so that you are one of the first people to know when we have opportunities for you to come up here and do ski flying, tailwheel flying, float flying, land in amazing places, see awesome things, go see crazy wildlife all up close, flying to these amazing places here in Alaska. Definitely make sure you get notified and also check out some of the updates on our website. The link is in the description below. If you guys have any questions on this or anything else flying related, ground school related for your private instrument commercial, CFI, tailwheel, seaplane, all sorts of stuff on the website, then definitely go ahead and click on the ask a question tab at the top of the page on flyatmikealf.com. Check out all the new CFI courses, the new multi-engine course, all that cool stuff happening there. And as always guys, if you cannot fly every day, then fly 8 stay warm out there, and we will see you guys in the next one.